Today, we are going to talk about the infamous case of the morgue monster. The necrophiliac killer that has terrorized Britain since the 1980s. This was a true monster who showed no mercy as he performed those horrific acts on the corpses of his victims. And it remains one of the most disturbing cases in modern British criminal history. In the year 1987, two young women were brutally beaten, sexually assaulted, and strangled to death just months apart. More than 33 years later, with the aid of cutting-edge DNA technology, the case was finally resolved. But the story doesn't end there. After his arrest, police searched his apartment and found a far more disturbing discovery, which totaled his victims from two to hundreds or even thousands. Tunbridge Wells can be found in Kent, England, 30 miles southeast of the city of London. It is situated not far from the East Sussex border, on the northern edge of the High Weald, with a population of about 60,000. On a Monday, June 22, 1987, Wendy Nell, a 25-year-old manager at Supersnaps, left work at about 5 p.m. She headed to the bank first for some errands and then headed right back home. Later that day, she went to her boyfriend's mother's house and spent the entire evening watching TV with them. At about 11 p.m., her boyfriend sent her home with his motorcycle, because he had an early shift the next morning, so he only dropped her off in front of her ground floor bedsit. They kissed goodnight, and she waved him off from her porch. She was wearing black cords, a black leather jacket, and carrying a crash helmet at that time. The following morning, Wendy's mother received a call from Supersnaps, telling her Wendy did not show up for work, so her mother called her boyfriend to check on her. He rode to her apartment and knocked on her door. No one answers, so he went around the back of the house and climbed through a window into her flat, which could not be locked as the latch was painted over. When he got inside, he saw Wendy lying on the bed, naked, with only a duvet covering her. He can still see her head over the duvet. He walks over and pulls down the duvet. She is motionless, so he tries lifting her arm and opening her eyelids. This is when he realizes she is already dead. Shocked by the scene in front of him, he climbed back out of the window and rushed to the nearby fire station for help. The pair were planning to get married once they came back from their trip to Paris. Wendy was very excited about it. But unfortunately, her excitement and anticipation of their life together were cut short when her lifeless body was discovered. There are no signs of forced entry, and no one has heard anything from the flat. Police believe the killer broke into Wendy's bedsit through the faulty window and waited. Wendy had been battered with a blunt, heavy object, strangled, and sexually assaulted. The forensic team was able to collect the DNA of the killer from Wendy's body. They also found a bloody fingerprint on a millet's bag in Wendy's bed, and a bloody footprint of a clerk sports trek trainer on one of her blouses that did not belong to Wendy or anyone related. Wendy's distinctive keyring and diary were also missing. Police suspect it was taken by the killer as a souvenir. The police are concerned, because most killers who take souvenirs are likely to kill again. Five months following Wendy's murder. On November 24, 1987, Caroline Pierce, a 20-year-old restaurant manager at Buster Brown's, was abducted from outside her flat in Grosvenor Park. Her flat was only a mile away from Wendy's. She was last seen at midnight, dropped off by a taxi at her home after a night out with friends. She was wearing a long black skirt and a red sweater at that time. Later, her neighbors reported hearing a woman screaming, no, repeatedly for about 30 seconds, although they peered out their windows. But the darkness prevented them from seeing anything. Three weeks later, a farmer discovered her body more than 40 miles away from her home in Romney Marsh. She was found naked and fetal inside a water-filled roadside ditch. Like Wendy, she had also been sexually assaulted, battered, and strangled. The killer's DNA collected from her body was identical to Wendy's killer. Caroline's keys, 
along with Buster Brown's keychain, are also missing. A task force was set up with the help of forensic evidence and witness accounts, but despite their best efforts, the police were unable to find a definitive suspect, and the case has remained unsolved for many years. In 2008, the police set up a cold case task force to follow up with the investigations. The killer's DNA and fingerprints are still well preserved until they can find a match one day. In 2017, Wendy's father, Bill, died from cancer. His dying wish was to see his daughter's killer found. Wendy's family hoped that their patient would eventually be rewarded. Despite the decades that have passed since Wendy's murder, advances in technology have allowed for the preservation of crucial evidence. The police have continued their efforts to solve the case in an effort to bring closure to the family. 33 years later. In the year 2020, the police finally made a breakthrough by looking through similar DNA in their database. They were able to identify approximately 1,000 people whose DNA was similar to the killer's. And then, from that number, they narrowed it down to 90 individuals. The police interviewed each of those 90 individuals, collected their DNA and fingerprints, and eventually, after a great deal of hard work and dedication, it finally led them to the killer's doorsteps. Say. Yes. Just, um, we're from Kent Police and we're investigating the murders of Wendy Nell and yes. Caroline Pierce in 1987. Okay. As part of that investigation, you've been linked as a suspect, both geographically and forensically. Okay. If you listen to what my colleagues are going to say to you. Yes. All right, David. You're under arrest on suspicion of the murders of Wendy Nell and Caroline Pierce in 1987. Do you understand? Yes. You do not have to say anything, but it may harm your defence if you do not mention, when questioned, something which will later on in court. Anything you do say may be given in evidence. You are being arrested to secure and preserve evidence by means of questioning. So we can conduct searches, so forensic samples can be obtained, and to prevent your disappearance. Do you understand? David Fuller, born in 1954 left school at the age of 16 to become a training electrician. Fuller has a violent criminal history since a very young age. He repeatedly committed crimes like burglary, vandalism, and arson over the years, but despite his lengthy criminal record, Fuller somehow managed to avoid any jail time. This causes Fuller to feel an immense sense of invincibility and a lack of remorse for the destruction he causes. Fuller was married three times. His first marriage lasted 10 years with a son and a daughter. During that period of time, they were living on the same street as Wendy Nell. During his second marriage, he joined the cycling club with his wife and also developed an interest in bird watching. These activities take place near Romney Marsh, where Caroline Pierce's body was found. His third marriage to Mala lasted more than 20 years with a son they left him after learning the truth about him following his arrest. David Fuller was arrested at his home on December 3, 2020. He denied all the charges read to him. Police compared his DNA and fingerprints to those found at Wendy Nell's crime scene, and they matched perfectly. Police also found photo evidence that he owned the identical clerk sports trek trainer that left a blood print on Wendy's blouse during that period of time. Additionally, they are able to find a notebook that Fuller used to record his crimes. All of this evidence combined to make an overwhelmingly convincing case against Fuller. While the police were searching for more evidence in Fuller's house, they discovered more than 4,000 hard drives, discs, DVDs, and memory cards hidden around his house. 
containing millions of explicit images and videos of children and extreme pornography. In addition, police also recovered two hard drives, which were stashed in a box, screwed to the back of the drawers, and placed inside a wardrobe. On these drives, they found photos and videos of Fuller recording himself while he violated corpses in the morgues. Fuller has worked as an electrician and maintenance worker at Kent and Sussex Hospital, and later at Turnbridge Wells Hospital, since 1998. Records show him using his security card to enter the morgue thousands of times, which is a very large number for a maintenance worker to access the morgue. Fuller's actions were all the more disturbing because, despite the obvious red flag, no one bothered to investigate for nearly two decades. From the recordings found at Fuller's house, he has been violating corpses in the morgue during his night shifts. Police identified more than 100 victims from 2008 to 2020. The youngest victim is 9 years old, and the oldest victim is 100 years old. There are also two 16-year-old girls and a 24-year-old student, who died after falling off a bridge. Police discovered from Fuller's computer that after his heinous acts, Fuller would look up the victim's page on social media. To satisfy his twisted desires, he would look at their photos, read the messages they had posted, and monitor the lives they had lived before their untimely demise. The victims identified are only from the evidence found in Fuller's house. Police speculate the actual victim count could go up to a thousand. David Fuller finally pleaded guilty to all charges on November 5, 2021. On December 15, 2021, Fuller was given two life sentences without parole for two counts of murder and 12 years for sexual offenses against 78 dead women and girls between 2008 and 2020. Although I think 12 years is too little, but it is good to know that a monster like Fuller will spend the rest of his life behind bars. Justice was finally served, and the victims' families can now live their lives knowing that the perpetrator will never be released. Fuller's sentencing serves as a powerful reminder that justice can be served, even in cases where it seems impossible. This is the end of my video. If you like my video, please give it a like and subscribe. And feel free to comment and correct me for any mistakes in the comment section. Thank you so much for watching.